to, 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 to see it too. <laughs> okay. Welcome to our work meeting tonight. Everybody, thank you for being here. Um, you know, Jared is online. Sherry is coming from water. But we do have a quorum. Um, we will get started. A review of this evening's agenda. Jonathan, I was going to ask, are you good until 7? Are you good? Whatever. Okay. We're just thinking of reading. I'm going to propose moving some items. I'd like to go... So 2.4 is actually Councilor Warren's. <coughs> something she was passionate about. So oh, okay. So we need to postpone that. Keep it. And Colin's not here yet. Let's start on 2.3, then. And then we'll see where we go. Is that okay? We can kind of decide based on who comes and who gets here. I would like sorry, 2.3 or 2.2? 2.3. I'd like 2.2 to be the last thing. Okay. Um, just so it, I'd like to get through the others and then that way we kind of give ourselves a deadline with 2.2. That makes sense. So are we okay if jumping and starting with 2.3? Are you okay with that? Okay. Okay. So we'll, we'll go that route. Um, any other comments or questions on the agenda today? Jackie, we do have two presentations tonight, like um, Mountain Ridge Hockey. We have the Mountain Ridge Hockey. And then the other? Um, Camden. Camden. That one I kind of told you about. Or Karsten. Karsten. Sorry, Karsten Ritchie. Karsten Ritchie. Is kind of nice. about a gun range in Harriman and uh, get some updates as to what's out there, locations, updates, current ideas, all that stuff. Awesome. Okay. Um, Sherry had asked me to bring up one. She actually really liked your suggestion, Steve, about looking into changing our public comment policy so we can have some interaction. Sherry says she received an email stating that in Tremont they just changed there so they can have conversation during. So she would just like to have that maybe a work meeting item. Interesting. Um, former rep Kim Coleman, I don't know if you guys know Kim, mm -hmm. um, she actually wrote something about um, how people feel disenfranchised and feel like the decisions are made before they get there. There's a lot of frustration. I think we've all experienced that at various times, but I think that Sherry's uh, wanting to put that on the discussion is a great idea. I think that's yeah. something we should look at, figure out how to do it. I mean, it's a double-edged sword, right? You don't want to... Well, it helps us understand, too, how we can interact with them, because sometimes we want to say something or vocalize something, but... This would be on all public comment. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's even helping us understand what to do. Yeah. Is it, it's in our, their policy, right, Jackie? Mm -hmm. So are there other things in the policy? Should we look at the policy as a whole to see if there's other things, or do you just draw? God, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> just, just bring that one I Please, no. Okay. okay. Please, no. And so maybe it's even just presenting us with that dream, what dream mom's doing, and we can look at it. One at a time. time. <laughs> Right. Yeah. This, this evening came up with the planning commission where we were wondering about do we want to have just that general open comment period like the council currently has. It was just a question. So I've always wondered about that in planning commission yeah. too. But yeah. I think you're talking about somebody says something, can you then enter into a dialogue? Right. I don't I don't I, I can't remember what this policy says. I, I think you can. You just have to be careful if you're in a in, a, in some sort of land use area that there, there are more rules that come in there because you could be subject to a lawsuit. So you just have to be careful on how you're interacting and if you, you get one side more time. And you don't but want to interrupt can, their presentation yeah. time. Yeah. So we can have, uh, we can bring it forward and you guys can talk about it. And there may be another part of the policy that you guys might want to discuss when we kind of get into the, the OPMA discussion. 
discussion because there we do have a policy that um, about voting that if you abstain from voting that it's put in the record is okay. as a no. So that policy you might want to look at as well and see if that's something you want to continue to do. Really since when it does not been defined as many cities that record it as a yes. If you abstain for no reason. But then, yeah. That's not about yes, no. Yeah. Yeah. Just kinda <laughs> and then there's the third one we want to look at. <laughs> and then, I don't know, we can we can bring this up another agenda item, or I think we all saw the email this week from our lobbyist. Interim session is going to be on, right? On this, right? I know we, we need to have a bigger discussion about our strategy moving forward with our legislature and our lobbyists and that sort of thing. But I think no matter what we do, I think changes for that are probably going to be after interim. So I don't know if we can even do something where we get a head nod where I guess we're asking, I brought this up with Nathan, maybe if council's okay, we can try to just start setting up something now with our lobbyists. Right now, our current lobbyists, maybe Nathan, Wendy, myself, then I come up with a plan and then we get it out to you guys, our plan to have the interim. And then we can have a bigger discussion later. Just, just have a plan just for the interim for right now. Yeah, I would love to see... I mean, some of us have decent relationships, personal relationships with our legislature, but I would love to see maybe doing an interim lunch or meeting or something, a one-on-one -on -one with, with a couple of council members in the... In the and that's what I'm saying. I would put that in front of them. We would put that yeah. in the plan, because yeah. I absolutely agree with that. I don't think I don't want it to be me doing no, it. I'm yeah. just saying we could just have a quick meeting with our lobbyists, pull them in. Because a lot of stuff they worked on is him. happening now. Yep. So I think a lot of decisions can be now, and we missed the boat on it. Yep. Here you guys will okay with that or do we want more people involved again this is just the plan then we'd come to the whole council to say this is how we want to attack into it yep. all of us as a whole it's a lot okay. easier to coordinate three schedules or four schedules rather than seven or eight okay guess we'll get with the lobbyist okay are we staying with the same lobbyist or is it that's, the, that's a conversation you have to have but with I, them, I think okay. there, that's probably happening this interim is going to be on yet. Yeah, just in a couple weeks. Yeah. Okay. So we don't want to miss the interim stuff by. So definitely. Okay. Any other future agenda? I did mention your sharing on the way in. It's actually Steve's, but I just wanted to follow it up. Okay. Okay. Any other future items? Okay. No. And then our meetings will be really short. <laughs> <laughs> I see, this, I see the trend go. <laughs> okay. Council discussion of future citizen recognition. Is anything you know? I'm seeing anything grab my attention. Not, not lately, but I know we'll have some end of year for school and uh, sports and that. Sports. Sports. Yeah. Okay. Um, do we we do our scholar? Do we still do the scholarship? Or something like that too, as a city or? Yes, yeah, we're so. interviews are tomorrow. That's the Thomas Park. Yeah, the Thomas Park bill. That's okay. it. Is that something you all want to discuss in a future meeting and looking at how that scholarship is set up? And well, the only, review it, but. the only, uh, bad, <clears throat> sorry, the bad thing is it doesn't feel like we get very many applications. It's just two and last or three. And, you know what I mean? Between two and three applications is all we usually get. And a lot of it is service. But there's a lot of kids in our community that do service. I just wonder how well it's um Advertised or push out, you know what I mean? How, how many people really understand is available? wonder if we market the counselors at schools, let them know it's there. I, th I, think, I think that we do. do. Yeah. I, I don't know how you get more people to be involved. You know, that, that would be the only discouraging thing is there's not a lot of applications. So we can put something together on the board and see how they're marketing it. Okay. Another agenda item. <laughs> okay. We'll move on. Just bring it on yourselves. I'm just saying. <laughs> that one could probably be a memo. <laughs> yeah, there we go. There, there we go. Memo. Memo that one. Okay. So, Sherry, here, are you okay moving on to your city council subcommittees? Talk about that. Oh, yeah. yeah so sure. They're taking it out of order. We're taking it out of oh, order. Oh, got you. We want to make sure we leave as much time as we can for the. Oh, for we the. We don't want to cut the pitch. Yeah. 
So you want to talk about that? Um, I just. Um, I'll let you two kind of. Yeah. Do you want me to? See? Yeah. It's, okay. It's your idea. Um, so we have talked at different times about the importance of making sure we communicate with the school district, and like literally, I talked to to um, Daryl the other day. Didn't know exactly what was getting built over there. You know what I mean? So it's like, oh, that's the new flex school, and I'm like. Well, I'm glad I just talked to you to find that out, right? So um, it just feels like there's a little bit of breakdown in, in maybe the communication, is why it's to me. But um, not not anybody's fault but my own, but I just feel like there should be maybe some better communication so that we're all on the same page with, this, with the school district and us. I had some conversations with Chief about the, the school shootings, quite frankly, about um, what is our role in that, how do we play a role in that, those types of things. and. I don't think we can, I think that we're united as the hip in playing roles on that kind of thing to, to make sure our, our community is aware of things, but I think we have to be in partnership and in tandem with the school district, and I think the best way to do that is to have meetings with them. And I wouldn't suggest that we all, five of us have a coordinated meeting because it doesn't seem to make sense, but we have our finance committees and we have our, our economic <coughs> development committees and things like that. It seems like it would make sense that we just form a, a committee that meets with the school district. I, I don't know how many of them that want to meet, or just a couple of them, or the people in our area, or whatever, but that we just have a standing committee meeting that two of the people on the council meet with, with some of the people on the school district so that we just stay up to speed on different things and different issues that we hear on our end. That will take, you know, some input from staff to say, here's some of the complaints we got in about the, the, those kinds of things so that we just kind of can keep a good dialogue with them and. And I, and I, quite frankly, was, I am extremely concerned about some of the, um, uh, sh the school shooting and what kind of training is, is being done with our, with our, with our students. Um, I, I interacted with my granddaughter and I was a little bit concerned about how she would respond or something to that if somebody was there. And so I just would like us as, as a community leader to understand is there some more things that we can do to help um, our community be better prepared for disasters or things of that nature, you know? And so, um, and I don't know the answers. You know, I talked with Chief and Nathan and, and few, just, I don't know the answers, but I think that if we had a committee that can address some of those concerns and see where, what role we can play in helping um, make a better prepared community for those types of things, and in addition, I think it's important that we understand what school is coming in, where the school is coming in, why it's coming in there, those types of things. Just so I'm not suggesting we have any say on that because we don't. But um, I think it's important to be in the know on it. But I think if we're meeting, I think that must be hard. Yeah. Daryl's been asking for us to do this since, I, since yeah, last year. So I think, for sure. I think that we talked to Mike Anderson yesterday, and he's uh, the assistant superintendent. He's all. I also think it should probably include a conversations with the community college oh. and what's going on over there as well. I love yeah, it. Sure, sure. It, it's just maybe even the education, you know, us and the education leaders or something. Yeah, because yeah. because uh, I also don't want to eliminate. I just talked about Jordan School District, but what about the charter, the charter schools? schools. Yeah. We have a lot of those in our community, so I just think that we should have this pool of people that are meeting together that are helping. That'll give us a lot of insight to the future, but driving public trans or tracks or other information data that we say we need something at that community college, right, to help facilitate them, and then it helps the other areas or business and parking structures or how you know I don't know if it would have helped with the Oakleaf scenario if we had more front end information. We had elected officials talking to elected officials to help disseminate that information. So um, I know that got a little pressurized, but. Anyway, I, I would just Let's recommend that we set up that committee. Okay. Do you want to read? Uh, I think the easiest way would be to set it up by, by a policy, just create one without putting in an ordinance or anything like that, so we can draft something. Perfect. Okay. Do we want to pick a couple people today, or do we want to wait for the policy to come um, to assign? Why? You just do, I think you could pick it. We'll just do the policy, mm -hmm. and it'll just say, here's what you're doing. Do you want to? It's going to be very very sort of simple. simple. Make it happen, start it happening tonight? Yeah, I would like, I would like and to I be think on you, yep. the, um, the, you know, at, at the Absolutely, I'm supportive of that. Any, discretion of the council. Anybody want to be the second one? Jared. <laughs> uh, he's a liar. <laughs> I'm just kidding. He's not here. We can not here. He's, uh, he's not available for that. <laughs> <laughs> Call back later. Um, I can, I can do that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 
Do you just think once a month, maybe? Yeah, probably a quarter. I don't know that too. we'd be able to coordinate that many people once a month. Probably well, and you might, you might rotate it like one month is with the school Charter district, one month is with the Community. higher education. We'll have to figure out that, yeah. yeah. Um, Mike, yeah, every week. Mike did say he can coordinate any facility to any, any building. So you can rotate, yeah, you can rotate any any area in the, in the city or district. We can even go into South Jordan or Bluffdale or wherever if you wanted to. Thank you. Cross boundary. Yeah. Finishing up, putting all the estimates together. Okay. No, it's good. Okay. Thank you. Like, I apologize. We were talking about that first one. I thought that was one we were anyway. So, we're going to 2.3 now. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry, Jack. I'm supposed to be all over the board. TSA. We're going to 2.3. Like, it works. Talk longer, you know. So, we're all over the board. When is it going to be to go that extreme? I was like, wow. No, no. You didn't miss it. You're like, dang it. This is a discussion um, that was had probably back in 2016. We're going to revisit it. So, I don't know if anyone here was even part of this. But um, at that time, there was a desire, there was some development happening in what we call Old Town, and we were taking these in lieu and all sorts of things about road improvements required because the larger lots were being split or put into flag lots. So at that time, the council adopted um, an ordinance to accept this area that's within the yellow boundary from having to install curb and gutter. And so they, they adopted a different road cross section that I'll show here in a minute. And that's what applies to this area, except for along and the three roads that were called out were 6,000 West, Main Street, and 6,400 West, which isn't even on within the area, but those areas still have to install the road. road. So that's a little bit of the background. Um, this is a specific area that um, we had a request from a resident, a uh, resident on the corner across the fire station has been asking that uh, there's going to be some excess right-of-way when we put this new road section in. They want that right-of-way um, vacated or abandoned and given to them. So we started looking into what that would entail. And uh, so this is a drawing of what the existing cross-section looks like. The right-of-way is 98 and a half feet, just about. The road's really narrow and uh, old through that area. And so you see there's about 37, 40 feet on each side that is unused. Um, and then the next slide I have, the this is the cross-section that was adopted by the council at that time. There's no curb and gutter. It's just asphalt. Um, and then there's a swell. And then an asphalt path that is 10 feet wide on each side. So this is a 60-foot wide cross-section is what it would be. So that's typical of what our cross-sections are. So they line up which, if you, if you look at the next exhibit, this is a little hard to read, but in the green is the existing, and black is what's proposed in the future. And so you can see that back of sidewalks, which would also be the property line, leaves about 19 and some feet um, excess property. So that's the background. The request is to vacate the needed area. And as we got looking at it, we thought maybe it's not best to go lot by lot and do this. So we started talking, and I talked with Michael and talked with other engineering staff. And maybe it's best to go from one side of the, one end of the block to the other, the whole street, and have all the property owners work together to go out and hire a surveyor and get the description written for the area that's to be vacated. We identify a center line, and then they have to sign off that center line. There's a lot of stuff that will go into this design, like get the utilities, if there's a sewer manhole where the swell is going to be, we might need to shift the road over a foot so the manhole's outside the swell. A lot of little things. Where if we do one by one, it's going to be complicated. If we do a whole street, it might be easier. Um, it does put a little bit of cost on the residents, but they are also going to get property at the end of the day out of this if the council chooses to vacate that property. Uh, there's also some background, I was talking with Todd about it, property was it's acquired by the city by a plat that was recorded so long ago that it's so fragile the county won't let you do anything with it but take a picture of it. So, so it's, it's uh, old documents, a lot, of, a lot of boundary 
work needs to go into the survey. So one of the options I think I listed in the staff report was we could go through and do the whole Old Town area ourselves and identify all the property, but it would probably cost several hundred thousand dollars <coughs> to go and do that work. So the recommendation was that you put this in policy that if someone requests to vacate the unnecessary right of way in front of their property, that they have to go work with their neighbors. They have to create the descriptions and then request that be vacated and, and do the legwork. And then I guess on top of that, is this cross section even what even meet the vision of this council now? Because that was several years ago that they that this, this was adopted. There could be a survey sent out to the, to the residents in the area to say, is this what, or, or to the residents even outside <coughs> that, is this what Old Town Harriman looks like? Do we want to do something different? I, that was not done before. It was just kind of <clears throat> I will say at the beginning of the school year, we received a lot, some pressure early on, complaining that people who moved in there recently, there are no sidewalks. How come my kids aren't walking? How come there are no sidewalks? So I don't know if the feel of that neighborhood is changing as people are, houses are turning over, new people are in there. Um, so it's kind of in, at the time, you're still, will you? You don't get sidewalks there. You, that was a decision that was made. You didn't want them. So I think that's there's also some pressure. I don't know if anybody, it's probably your area. So there's never been yeah, a discussion about budget planning. to go in and build any of this. <clears throat> so what we've seen is one lot in the middle becomes a flag lot, and then we've taken a fee and loom. It's improvements, or we've required them, and you've got improvements in one spot and not anywhere else. So it gets are, really are we holding okay. impact fees on the this area right there, there are no impact fees for this kind of stuff. But you can't use them for this, but if they develop, they pay impact fees. Okay. Will the vacation, vacating the right of way impact um, or restrict the ability to make a change requiring those in the future? Or do you need to preserve that excess right of way in case you wanted to require? curb and gutters and sidewalks in the future time. That's you could fit you curb, gutter, and sidewalk in it. The complication is we may have to go back and get uh, easements, temporary construction easements. So we'd have to the tie road. their driveway back in if the road ends up higher and lower than their existing grade. What is our current proposed right away for new development, new construction? <coughs> um, for these roads, it would be 60 feet. And we're, we're right there. Yeah. Very so close. That's why we did it that way. So that matches our current code. It from matches the width. It's just a different configuration of the Because of the swell on the crown. And, okay. Yeah, the, the asphalt's narrower. And yeah, no curb and gutter. Can you require that, or is that legal to require that? Like if you said, yeah, we'll allow this, but you also have to allow it in the future at the right uses. That be part of I think we could do that, something like that. Yeah, yeah. just so that if that's a, a foreseen problem, can we jump on it now? We're only sure giving them the 20 feet, right, or the 19, whatever. Yeah. On the so they probably keep a, a public utility easement in there. And as yeah. I've looked at it, there's some water lines and sewer lines are kind of in different places in each road. So we may have to. The, the road might go 17 feet on one side and 20 yeah, on the other. We may have to shift the road. So some people might only get 7 or 8 feet. Oh, okay. If we maintain like a, a, a maintenance easement, mm -hmm. that's going to be sh more shallow than, say, a front yard setback. So they wouldn't be harmed if we even kept the easement, but they received the property. Mm -hmm. But what if they, so they improve this customer probably wants, or this customer, this uh, neighbor wants to improve their yard, potentially. That's why they're asking for that land. So fence, whatever, yeah. that's where we're going to have some issues if it, they put the fence in, and five years down the road, we put the curb and gutter five feet into the property that we gave them, right? Yeah, but that's why we keep the easement there. This curb and gutter should be 10 feet off of that yeah. property line. Okay. You'd have, if you went back and adopted the standard cross section, you'd okay. have a five foot sidewalk, five foot park strip, curb gutter. I like your proposal, Blake. I think that's, I think the 60 foot's the right way, and I think vacating that. And it, it has to happen block by block, it can't happen. It, yeah, it's not. House by house. It's, I don't know that I'm in a hurry to change the policy about the asphalt just simply because we don't have the money to do it. Right? No, but they, they want to improve their yard, so. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't know that as far as the policy about that, unless there's new development that's going in there, you have to buy. But um, even at that, we could we could charge PMU or something, right? 
possibly. So the, the thing that I think spurred this is this home is a new home. And so we allowed them to push that up, knowing that this is going to look this future configuration. Uh -huh. So I think they saw the front yard go up to here, and they were like, oh, well, we'd like to match our front yard up as well. Plus, there's some, this used to be the car seat dump, and yeah. the, this resident has talked a lot about, yeah. Yeah, there's there's a lot of the glass there recycling. he's picking yeah. up, and taking, he's taking care of the right away, so like, it should be my property, so that, that was some of the comments I've got. And we were able to move that building forward because there's a provision in the code in this section that allows uh, a setback to be considered from the center line of the road, which was something that you were able to administrate. So, so that black that line was, currently their setback line? That's so, the cross section. Oh, and this is the property line. Okay, okay, that's their current so property line. So we put our playground partway into the right of way. Is there any historical yeah, preservation yeah. or anything Coach like me. that that we have to know about? <coughs> okay. Kids are playing in the street. Um, if you look really close, you can see some power lines here. So there yeah. might be, we just need to look at the utilities. And, we I, really drive it. and I don't mind like notifying the residents, but you've got every address in that area. I, I wouldn't over notice outside that area because they shouldn't be able to say what happens in your front yard. I think it'd just be those people in that affected area. Mm -hmm. That's my view. Yeah. Agreed. So for the example on this one, as he's requesting, we, he said he's talked to all his neighbors and all on board. So it would just be some cost, and I know that was a concern of the applicant. For a surveyor to come out and yeah. put some dots on him. My comment was, you're getting property, so. And we're not going to charge for that? I don't think we can. Yeah, you just release the right away, right? Is that? We're going to vacate yeah, it because it was yeah. dedicated on a very, very old plot. Okay. We, we work really good as reviewers, so if they submit and not the actual creator of the document. So if they hire a surveyor, they create the legal descriptions for each lot. You they can submit and those, it. and then we would just bring those to council through the normal surplus process. Yep. Okay. Vacation process. Yeah, it's not really surplus property because it's just a right of vacation. Yep. 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 So, so yeah. Yeah. Should we go with yeah. option one, then? That one yeah. Vacation, yeah, was good. not the good guy. <laughs> <laughs> not the good guy. All right. Thank okay. you. That helps me out. Okay, we're going to move back to 2.1. I've been told seven minutes, Todd. <laughs> I'm and just saying. I will be as fast as I can. I did this in the Mosquito Abatement District, and it was a nine-minute video. So if you're longer than nine minutes. <laughs> but what did you video. learn in nine minutes? <laughs> I learned <Whoa>. everything. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, I'll just get right into it. So the public policy of the Open and Public Meetings Act is to have governmental entities exist to aid in the conduct of people's business. The intention is for entities to take their actions and, con and conduct their deliberations openly. Um, you all know what a public meeting is. It's uh, every meeting, with limited exceptions, is open to the public. A meeting is whenever a majority of you meet, and that's the definition of a quorum, is a simple majority. Um, <clears throat> so the public must be allowed to attend public meetings, but interestingly, there's no requirement to allow for public comment unless there's a law that requires it, like a land use change or something like that. Um, but I don't know if you saw this in the news, Pocatello residents raise frustration after public comments are eliminated from council meetings. So you can see that public does want to be engaged. They want to be there. That's public policy decision on whether or not you allow them to do that. Um, so for uh, public comment and discussion, so it's at the discretion, this is in Utah code, at the discretion of the presiding <coughs> member of the public body, the mayor, a uh, topic raised by the public may be discussed during an open meeting, even if the topic raised by the public was not included in the agenda. So the key is, is you can't take any actions that would require some type of voting. You could say, oh, let's talk about this for a minute. Uh, I'll direct you to staff to work on this issue that you're talking about and go from there. But it can't be, oh, oh that's a great idea on a conditional use permit. We're now going to grant you a conditional use permit. <coughs> that Sorry, that's a tree mountain. Uh, apparently, they said they just changed theirs to allow, allow that to, where people can just discuss. Yeah. Okay. According yeah. to our resident. We do have a policy as the as the council on what the policies and procedures are that govern the meeting. Mm -hmm. This presentation isn't going to cover that. I think it'd be a good idea to to relook at that. They actually asked us to bring them yeah. this specific. Okay. So uh, yeah, I think that'd be great. And this came up at the last meeting. Um, 
Meetings before and after a meeting. This is something that I think is always uh, need to be talked about. Be aware of discussion items before a meeting or after a meeting as, as a group. Um, and Utah Code says that there's no violation if it's a social gathering or a chance gathering. So if you're at so-and-so's birthday party and yeah, there's three of you that happen to be there. But like this uh, cartoon depicts, all those in favor of what we discussed in our email thread at Larry's son's birthday party say aye, everyone's winking, yes, 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 and then the public's like, I don't know what just happened. That's exactly what we don't want to happen. Um, I'll get, this is a good example. I don't know if you saw this in the news a couple years ago, but this is when COVID started and schools were shut down and there was a parent that was really involved on, I wanna know what, what's gonna be the school district's decision on, on whether it's gonna be virtual or in-person or hybrid. So this parent went to every meeting and wanted to know, okay, what's the discussion gonna be? Because I'm, I'm a citizen, I have, I have five kids in the school system. And then they just made a vote during a meeting without hardly any discussion. And this, this parent thought, well, surely there's something more to it. So uh, she did her research, she did a grammar request, not just one, but I think three. Uh, I know because a grandma requested her grammar request. Um, and and she found there are emails and text messages where they're talking back and forth about something. Wow. So uh, um, uh, I, I don't know how to say this board member's name. Uh, it's this guy right here. He was left out of the chains uh, because they didn't appreciate him or agree with his opinion. So um, he was kind of left out of the loop on everything. So he was wondering geez, there's got to be an open and public meetings violation because there are things being discussed. It's in group messages. Uh, yeah, probably. Uh, they could probably do that. Um, emails, text messages, and conference calls. So anytime you have a quorum, uh, that's when you have to notice something. And Jackie will send out notices when she thinks there's going to be a quorum involved. Be aware of group emails. This can be a little bit tricky because we do use emails all the time. Um, and so be aware of online uh, collaboration. And even though you might technically be able to send an email out and you can send it to everyone um, and it doesn't uh, garner a discussion from like, yeah, well, I'm going to send out an email regarding this and then someone else replies and that uh, has another discussion to it and then you vote on something and there's no discussion in the public meeting. Uh, be aware of code versus perception. We want to be open. We want to be deliberate, just like the public policy states in, in OPMA. Um, you can choose to use your personal emails and devices for communications. However, and this legislature does this all the time, they use your personal emails and devices all the time. Um, be aware that what you do for city business, regardless of what device you're on, regardless of what email you use, can be subject to grammar. Um, there's complications if it's on your own personal device. Uh, in fact, there was a bill that was uh, proposed this year that stated, if you do use your personal device and you don't give that device to the city to review, you then have to sign an affidavit saying that whatever is being requested from my phone or my tablet or whatever, uh, I'm giving you everything and if and you have to sign an affidavit and if you don't give everything, then that's class B misdemeanor. Um, it didn't pass, but that goes to show you can't hide behind a personal device to avoid grandma or to avoid maybe a criticism or something like that. Um, there is a Utah code that specifically says you cannot text, is, it basically says you can't use any electronic device during a meeting to another council member. Um, so don't do that. Uh, we're gonna take a hypothetical, this would never happen. Um, a city has an upcoming council meeting to potentially rezone a property from agricultural to multi Housing. I didn't know Olympia was going to be here, uh, so that's not really. Uh, so the developer could build 1,500 units of low-income apartments. Uh, this issue is very contentious between council, residents, and staff. So council member one wants to know where some of the other uh, council members stand on the issue. Council member two, uh, one calls council member two, and then council member four. Second scenario is council member four then sends an email to all the council and states the reasons why the other council members should vote a certain way, which causes several other councilors to respond. Uh, scenario three, the council holds a public hearing and during the meeting, council members two and three text each other about the issue. So regardless of whether the rezone is passed, or is there a violation of the Open and Public Meeting Act for one, two, or three, or all of them, or none of them? 
Let's talk about number one. Is there an issue for council member one calling council member two and council member four? Are they on the same call? No. 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 Uh, I talked to Todd Godfrey, who's the legal counsel for the Utah League of Cities and Towns, about this very issue. He believes that Utah code implies that there that this should happen. We want the council to be engaged with each other. We also don't want a meeting to occur. Uh, council uh, uh, number two, sending an email, garnering a discussion. Yes. Yes. You, it's it's not real clear in Utah code, but it, it likely meets the criteria. And again, this goes to code versus perception. Number three. Most definitely. Most definitely. There's Utah code. I just talked about it. So... Uh, best practices. So on that talk, on yeah. two, when they're sending an the email, would that be different if it, they were just responding not to each other, but uh, emailing back to four? So they she email, four sends to oh. all the council, but one counselor just emails back to four without. I think that's the same thing as a phone call. Phone call. It's yeah. it's the reply <laughs> between all two people that gets you in trouble. Which yep. is why if the city sends out, we always blind copy, so you can't hit reply all even accidentally. So that that's one of the things that's be really careful of the reply all. Yeah. Uh, Nathan did not review my presentation, but he definitely hit this point. When emailing commissioners or counselors, use BCC. That way it prohibits that, that discussion, and it's more like a phone call. Um, if you're using city emails for anything related to city business, just make sure it's uh, your your uh, your public email. Um, if you have a city-owned phone, use it for city business. If you have your personal phone um, or a personal email that you use for city business, send those messages to your email account or something. So that way, we if we do get a grammar request, it's really easy to go through that. Um, if you have discussions with others, uh, state your position on the record. Again, we want to be open. We want to be deliberate in our meetings. And yes, you can all talk individually basically by yourselves but then when you go to vote you state your reasons why uh, state your reasons why you're taking that position the uh, the public wants to know even though sometimes we have to make hard decisions and it's hard when there's an angry crowd out there um, sometimes it's hard for me to make a, a legal opinion that's hard for the public to hear but we we need to do it um, when in doubt ask your friendly neighborhood city attorney if you have any questions do we have one no. Well, yeah, Matt. Matt's here. That's, that's Matt. He's the friendly one. Closed meetings. So how you enter a closed meetings, which is not mandatory. This is clear. You do not have to go into closed meeting if you don't want to. Um, it's allowable under certain criteria. So in the public meeting, you have to motion to go into closed meeting. That motion must include the reason for the meeting, um, which are limited to the pers uh, purposes, and we usually put them in, in your uh, yeah. agenda. Steve, I was a member, so. Two of five. Yep. Um, do you have to have a roll call on that motion? So, so we just had this conversation. Do you have to have a roll call if everybody unanimously says yes and you use that as your roll call? I would do a roll call. That's what Jackie said, too. Yep. <laughs> and I didn't even talk to Jackie about this. So we're just on the same page. <laughs> uh, the chair must state who is participating in the closed session and where the closed meeting will be held. So what can happen in a closed meeting? So we got to record it um, unless it's uh, there's a certain discussion that happens about an individual's character's competence, health, security personnel or devices. The recordings uh, may be disclosed by the court. You may not vote in a closed meeting um, except to close the meeting, which I think is kind of funny, um, and to enter them back into the public meeting. Actually, another city um, attorney asked me that question is, it's a real inconvenience to go and close and then have to go back into the public meeting. Can we just avoid that and just end a meeting in a closed meeting? And I said, no, there's there's actually a law on that. Um, any actions resulting from the closed meeting must be voted on in the open session. Uh, items from the closed meeting are to be kept confidential and should not be discussed outside the meeting. You can agree on direction, uh, let's say purchase of land, you can direct us to do something. We know that that's going to come before you to the vote anyway. Uh, I, I don't, this one uh, came out a couple of years ago. UTA under investigation, uh, under investigation for violating public meeting laws. Um, the Utah Attorney, uh, Attorney General um, noted that there were action items happening in closed meetings. And 
we have the recordings to prove it. So you got to be careful on, on what you talk about. And you've heard me uh, pipe up, hey, we're getting a little off track. Let's bring it back to the purpose of the meeting. Um, this was an interesting case. Uh, uh, the Southern Utah Wilderness Alliance um, sued King County and San Juan County, stating that there was a there was a meeting that happened. And what happened was, is that um, Interior Secretary Ryer Zink had several of these county commissioners come to Washington D.C. to talk about bears' ears, and uh, and uh, the Southern Utah Wilderness Alliance said that was a, a that you were meeting that was a public meeting, and. Um, the Southern Utah Wilderness Alliance said, no, we don't have any jurisdiction over Bears Ears. The court found that even though they don't have any voting authority over what happens with Bears Ears, the county has advisory authority uh, because that, uh, that Bears Ears National Monument is in King County and San Juan County. So they have an interest in it. So that should have been a meeting that was open to the public, and it wasn't. Um, this has come up quite often. I think it's a good reminder on what are receiving gifts. And I think we, we all think $50. And that's, that's about a, the extent. We know there's an issue if it's $50 or more. So, and you probably saw this. Uh, President Adams received a trip to the World Cup as well as uh, the Attorney General. I um, uh, can't remember his name. Um, and then in a Salt Lake Tribune article, Utah City should abide by the same gift rules as legislators, and that means no more jazz tickets or expensive meals. So let's talk about what the law actually requires. So you can accept gifts, and this is the one that everyone remembers, that are occasional and have a value of less than $50, or was awarded publicly for their public service. Uh, Mayor did a, um, he remembered the $50 thing. And he called me a couple months ago saying, I received this gift, and I just Googled it, and it looks a lot more. It was a, it was a baseball mint or something like that. Very nice. And he's like, can I, I, I don't know, can I take it? I said, yeah, you can. There's a provision in there that this was awarded to you as, as a gift for, for your public service. Um, you can also accept gifts of substantial value if the gift would not improperly influence a reasonable person and the reasonable person's position to, to depart from the faithful and impartial discharge of the public per, public person's public duties. So in other words, if someone else thinks that that might be a violation, then don't do it. Um, if that's going to sway your vote somehow. So let's say developer, let's pick on Olympia Hills uh, <laughs> for a second. Let's say they know that they're going to come and, and ask for a higher mill loan levy, for example. This will never happen. <laughs> Oh, my word. <laughs> <laughs> and let's say they offered a, a round trip to Disney World to each of you. Did they? Who was there Did they? Did they? Did they? Did they? last week, Ryan? Ryan was there last week. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> so if he did that, it's coming up on, on a vote. Even though that you might internally know that, yeah, what he does and what he's offering would not uh, persuade me to vote one way or the other. What would another person think? Would, would another person think that that would be persuading you? If that's the case, then don't accept it. Um, and you can't receive awards after the fact. So after, let's say, a mill levy's passed for a higher amount, then the new Disney World tickets come out and is offered to all of you. That's going to be an issue as well under under this law. So, uh, conflicts of interest. Um, this comes up occasionally. Most accusations are just very broad. They just say, you have a conflict of interest because I said so. Um, there's a councilwoman, Tanner, accuses the St. George uh, mayor of, of a conflict of interest in ambulance staffing because the mayor owned 12 years prior Dixie Ambulance. And supposedly she held a grudge against Gold's Cross, who is now asking for more ambulances in St. George. Technically, that's not a conflict of interest under the definition. We'll get into that. Um, and then former Tocqueville Mayor denies conflict of interest in contract with developers who had a consulting business who consulted with developers that were um, proposing to annex in to Toker, or, uh, uh, to, yeah, to Tocqueville. So could there have been? Maybe. Um, and the article was more about why the mayor resigned and 
this was not uh, because of this conflict of interest, uh, alleged conflict of interest. Um, so this is the law. A person has a conflict of interest if the person receives compensation for assisting a person entity in a transaction with the city without making a written and oral disclosure to the mayor and public. It's interesting that Utah Code, which is a little bit unique to Utah, does not require an abstention. You can still vote on it. Um, and the, the, the written, you have to file a written statement 10 days before a contract signed or before you receive comp compensation. My advice for best practice is to abstain and recuse. Um, that goes a long way in the public side, I think. But you can't make everyone happy. There's an article about that. Uh, this came out, uh, geez, four, yeah, about four years ago. Um, and this happens to involve my mayor, Mayor Zaltansky. And uh, there was a planning commissioner who's a developer in, on the San Diego City Planning Commission. And he presented an application to the planning commission for something, uh, recused himself, conflict of interest. Then he pre uh, presented that application to the city council. And Mayor Zaltansky, Tansky said, no, that's conflict of interest under the law. No, it's not. He recused himself. Did you know that oh, he used to I work in? <laughs> yeah, that was our project. <laughs> I, just, I just have been following. Wow. Uh, wow. <laughs> Come on, Byron. <laughs> he did resign. He did. That. He did. <laughs> and I haven't seen him since. But was this a technical violation of Utah code? No, it was not. <laughs> Absolutely not. But... Was there a perception that there was a conflict of interest? And the article goes, uh, Mayor Zaltansky thought, well, planning commissioners have clout with each other and the planning commission. Therefore, there should be none of that in the city. And so the article's about, well, I'm when I get in the city council, which she was running for at the time, I'm going to make a whole bunch of changes and things like that. I don't think anything has changed. But um, so even though you can do everything right, still be aware that you still might be criticized. What? <laughs> Just remember this. Everyone is listening and, and watching. Outrage erupts at LA council meeting over racist remarks. Park City Councilman charged with disorderly conduct in alleged cussing tirade. This was the, the school board that we talked about a little bit earlier um, with the school district. Uh, this was some of the, the grammar requests that the, that the lady got back. This was one council member to another during the meeting, total violation, uh, saying... Uh, the, the Catherine lady said, you need to the end of this meeting this time. So when the meeting did not end at that time, this is the text messages that were sent. So just be aware that Ooh. anything you do... do you think the oh. uh, I don't know what the blanks are. <laughs> it's never done. It's never done. But I'm, I'm sure there's someone in the corner that's oh, been a part done. of every discussion in here <laughs> can tell you. Um, just be aware that everything you do is to the public. David Church would always say, uh, being in public office is like wearing a, a thin bikini. Everyone's going to say, see what, what you're showing. And it's not always pretty. So, um, oh, thanks for that visual talk. <laughs> that was David Church. And he, he still says it to, the, to this day. Uh, pro tip, live life as though nobody is watching and express yourself as though everyone is listening. Any questions? Did you time that? Yeah. That was pretty good. You uh, that entertaining, good. Too. Yeah. yeah, that was the best that was, entertaining the little, one I've ever been to. The little jab. I don't know. Sure. Somebody else probably didn't think it was that entertaining. But. That was good. <laughs> Thank you. Good job, Todd. Thank you, Todd. Okay, we'll move on quickly to 2.2, .2, discussing on public infrastructure financing options. Are you going to be that much fun? No. Oh. <laughs> Kyle, are you leading now? Uh, I'll just do a quick intro. So the mayor and council had expressed an interest to discuss uh, public infrastructure financing options. Um, I reached out to our financial advisor, Jonathan Ward with Science Bank, who's going to lead you in a discussion about the different options available to a municipality. Jonathan? Yes. And how long do I have, Mayor? Till seven. Seven. Okay. I'll try to go fast. If there's specific questions to discuss as a group, we can do that. Okay. Start off with funding methods. Generally, public financing is done with a combination of one or all of these financing tools. You either save up and set aside, you pay as you go, you do some grant financing and obtain grants, or you do debt financing. Like I say here, illustrate here, 
most of the time it's a combination of a few or all of these separate methods. Each one has pluses and minuses, the positives and the negatives. If you look at pay-as-you-go financing with existing revenue streams, uh, you don't pay any interest expense. That's a clear positive. But under the negatives, you oftentimes wait a long time to finance public infrastructure and improvements. And you also bear the risk of higher inflation costs. That's been uh, pronounced in the more recent years of late. And certain, uh, certain residents will always say, well, we want to just pay as we go. We want to save up for this project. The fact is, in, in recent years, with double-digit inflation costs, we're often doing our residents a disservice by, by making them pay, if you will, a 10% inflation cost rather than maybe a 3% debt cost. So that's something to consider as you evaluate different methods of financing. Wow. Plus we can't save up a whole bunch of money. We're restricted on what percentage we can have. Absolutely. There's limitations. You can earmark some of that or set it aside in a capital projects fund to help grow that, but you're right. There are limitations on how often, I would how suggest much. there's also a risk of inflation costs with grants and debt financing, as we found out with Main Street. True. Yeah. Oh, yeah sure. if, you, if you aren't ready, if you do the debt first and you aren't ready for the project and you find out after the fact you haven't borrowed enough because inflation erodes the, the value of your dollar. Exactly right. Saving up and setting aside... Uh, doesn't it, it allows you to earn interest in that particular case. It doesn't cost you interest, but the money you save up, it is earning um, money for you. We do wait a long time to complete the projects, and you do risk inflation costs as well. Grants, no interest paid. Uh, you might be able to complete the project immediately, what we put, it, put as a positive here. However, grants usually come with conditions, strings attached, and the process is competitive and arduous. And more, I'd, I'd say here, more often than not, the grants are small. Even with the ARPA funds that the state received, I mean, they had literally billions of dollars worth of applications for the funds that they had that they wanted to grant out. They determined they were only going to give half of the project request for those that they actually awarded. And... It wasn't enough to get the whole project done. But they have helped in, in some regards for other, well, for certain types of projects. Debt financing uh, does allow cities to spread the cost of the project over those who benefit from it. And you do get the immediate use of a project, but you pay interest expense. And like Steve's suggesting, you do have potential inflation costs impacting this as well. So pay as you go. Let's look at the revenue sources available to, to do this. We've got impact fees that we collect on an annual basis and we can do certain uh, amounts of projects. We have utility revenues, tax revenues. We might have an earmarked fee, for instance, a, a road fee uh, where Pleasant Grove recently uh, was litigating their road fee and the Supreme Court said it was legit. You know, they did a, they had done an analysis. They said that was all right. You have a road fee to help offset the cost of roads. You could sell assets. Or in the case of UTA, I've got here um, maybe using some in, income-producing assets. UTA wants to re, uh, remodel and is in the process of remodeling and redeveloping their headquarters in downtown Salt Lake City. The discussion is, you know, 16-story building with UTA taking a couple of floors of that building with retail on the bottom and other residential above and using income from the building to help pay for their project and, and their office space. We're seeing more and more creative approaches like this where they're saying, let's, let's see if there's income that can be derived from the project itself to help us offset our costs. Using savings, uh, same resources, basically impact fees, utility revenues, taxes, earmarked fees, sale of assets, income producing assets. Grants from state and federal resources, whether it's water smart grants or you get brick uh, funding for certain water projects, you have some recreational grants available, but again, these are small and usually come with some strings attached. And then the city 
could issue debt on the far right hand side. The CRA, the community reinvestment area, could issue debt. The city could create service areas like you've done or special service districts that could issue debt, public infrastructure districts, uh, as would be will be discussed later tonight. Interlocal cooperatives could be formed and public private partnerships can also be involved in debt financing. So there's a lot of different tools that are available and the resources <laughs> Are, are available. It's interesting. There's a lot of derivations and a lot of things we do um, with the same resources. We've got a limited amount of resources, the revenues with which we're going to pay for the project. There's different ways to skin the cat, maybe uh, maximize those resources in different ways, use them in different ways, try to uh, uh, make, make up different benefits, if you will. But we are relatively limited. Historically, who's paid for what in the, in the infrastructure funding arena? Here in Utah, the city level, existing infrastructure replacement, almost always paid for by the public sector. When you've got to replace roads and water lines and sewer lines and parks and trails within your community, public safety improvements, you're going to do that on your own dime. That's, uh, that's generally you as a public sector. New infrastructure, however, has generally been funded by private uh, sector participants, with the public sector taking a back seat and occasionally participating. The developer, I've bulleted up there, would front costs. They might get reimbursed with home sales because they've built the, the price of the improvements in their, in their home prices. There might be impact fees that they get reimbursed because they've upsized the water tank, the water line, the road width, etc. Cities sometimes do provide new infrastructure uh, when, when planning for the future. We know we've got to put in this water tank because we've got huge growth. We've permitted all these homes on the west side of our city. We've got to have this water tank to meet the need. Otherwise, we won't have the pressure. We won't have the fire flow. We're going to be uh, out. So we're going to finance the tank. Harriman's done that over the years. Uh, Quite a bit, I think, actually. Put in the water tank, put in the water lines. Let's front the costs, knowing that people are coming behind and will help pay for that. Um, so that's been done in the past. But it's usually not how it's done. If you look around at other communities across the state where they have, uh, where there's a lot of growth, very often it's, um, it's this second, or it's this next point here push where possible. Uh, to have private sector fund the growth. Sometimes it doesn't work. There are market failures, there's public good arguments or concepts that might drive more public involvement if for some reason uh, the city wants something else. The private sector says, no way, we're not going to do that. That isn't our, that isn't what we do, that isn't, doesn't generate the revenue or the return for us. There might be then a role for government to step in and fill a void. Generally, if you look at sectors across the country that have been funded by private versus public, you see freight railroads almost exclusively funded by private sector. You don't see government getting into freight railroads here in the U.S. Telecom, almost exclusively private sector until more recently where you start seeing public sector saying, well, maybe that's something we want to look at. Energy as well. We're talking about power. There are a number of communities here in the state that provide their own power. You know, that isn't new, but you look gen across the country, power is generally provided by the private sector versus public safety, public sector, roads, public sector, water. Maybe I'll say sewer instead of water because sewer is almost always provided by public sector where there are some cases of private irrigation companies or private water companies providing the water, but by and large, those are common goods that the public sector will finance. So growth paying for growth. In an ideal world, as growth comes, they'll pay for themselves and everybody else who's already here in Harriman wouldn't have to deal with it. That's, I think, what we want to see happen. Uh, and should existing users pay for the growth? Does it cost me, if I'm already here, a lot extra because I've got all these new neighbors who want to move in. Uh, raising current tax rates and user rates in anticipation of that growth 
is pretty common. We can't currently use impact fees uh, with any, without, well, with a whole lot of uh, benefit to the city as security for bonds because they're speculative, right? That makes it really, really hard for an investor to say, okay, I'm comfortable with, with that as my revenue source. What we do instead is impose the impact fee, raise the water rates, or at least covenant to raise the water rates on everybody else in the city in the event those impact fees don't come to fruition. And when we do that, the rating agencies give us good ratings, we borrow at low tax exempt rates, and hopefully the impact fees are sufficient over time to come in and repay the obligation. We don't have to raise our user rates, but if not, We've promised to raise our rates, and that falls to all of us as existing rate payers to cover the debt. So that's our backstop. That's our security. The problem with impact fees, as cool of, uh, of a concept as they are, and I think, I think they really are well-intentioned to make growth pay for growth, there's so many limitations right now that it doesn't really work. We do the impact fee analysis, we set our costs up, tomorrow those costs are gone, you know, they've gone through the roof. And so what happens, we're collecting less than we really need to build that project five, six, seven years down the road. So we've automatically shifted the burden of growth construction and funding public infrastructure from growth to existing residents. Now existing residents are going to have to pick up the gap, basically fill the void. Can happen the same on bonds. Can, yeah. So it's not it's not just isolated to impact fees. We the last bond we did on the water bond we still on the tanks bill. So the money's sitting there and it's costing us interest. So <coughs> and and the cost of that is increasing every Gone day. up. So I mean I, I don't think that that's unique to impact fees. It can you can do the same with bids, bonds, anything like that. You're at the mercy of inflation. Inflation's gonna kill you. It will exactly right. We have a 10-year window, basically, under Utah law for impact fees. Six, really. We can spend our money. We've got to spend our impact fees within six years. But generally speaking, we can look at a 10-year planning horizon and see what's going, to, what's going to transpire in the next 10 years, and we can collect impact fees for those improvements. But what if we've got capacity in that road, in that water system, in that public safety system or parks and trail system, that really goes out 30 years. We really need these types of improvements over the next 30 year planning horizon, but we can only capture the cost in the next 10 years. That means we're basically getting a third of the impact fees that we need to cover our costs. And the other two thirds have to be picked up by the existing residents. So under this statute right now, there's these limitations that, that preclude growth from paying for growth. Sort of hard. Increasing level of service isn't eligible under the Impact Fee Act. So if there's already a road there, there's already traffic on it, you can't cover that cost. Only what is expanded and what's attributable to growth. Cost inclusions at historic costs rather than current levels or and never inflated at levels. We can't go to the Home Builders Association and, and their attorneys and say, we want to include this inflated cost for roads, water, sewer, public safety, and include that in our public safety impact fee. They won't, they won't allow it, even though we know it's going to be more expensive 10 years down the road. We've got to use current costs or buy in at historic costs if we already have the capacity. All of that translates into growth not paying for growth, but current residents paying for for growth. So are there solutions? <laughs> sort of hard. I don't think we've seen the best one yet. I'm not sure what it is. But isolating growth tends to be um, what we want to try to accomplish. So the city's imposed citywide property taxes in two service areas for police and fire. You can create service areas in smaller geographies of the city. You can create special service districts as we've talked about before uh, in certain parts of the city. 
that will isolate revenue and it will isolate up to that one area. That particular area pays for its own costs, if you will. City has historically done special assessment areas right here. As a matter of fact, there is a special assessment area in, in place. All of the residents around here have an assessment placed against their property. There's also a tax increment area. The third bullet up there included as an overlay. The incremental value of all the improvements here in the town center has grown such that that incremental property tax can now be used to pay assessments for the property owners here. So their growth has generated increased income to the city and it's dedicated towards paying for some of the infrastructure costs here, the roads, the water lines, sewer lines. So that's something that where, where we can isolate growth and try to make, make it work. Public infrastructure districts are the latest and greatest tool that cities have at their disposal to help isolate the cost of growth to the growth areas and help them pay for themselves. Some of the concerns with the solutions I know you've talked about at many, many city council meetings. If we create a special service district, we've got to have another layer of governance within our community, another board, their, their own separate entity. We don't want to do that. Multiple layers of tax. If half your city is taxed at a different level, does that politically limit your ability to, to do what you need to do as a city uh, with your own taxes? Because someone's going to say, no, nope, I've already been taxed too much. I'm not going to do it. There's a continuation of tax. Under the special service districts, there's no end to the tax. It just goes on and on and on, and it creates potential problems. Taxing entity participation under tax increment areas is hard to do. Nowadays, even more so, you get the school district, for instance, who is very opposed to sharing any future tax revenues with the city if it means that particular development is going to um, it's going to bring in more kids to educate. I was sitting in a meeting of the school board uh, not too long ago. One of their former board members read a four-page essay about why tax increment financing was the worst idea ever and how it was, it was uh, killing students. I mean, it was, it was, he was very passionate about it. And I think most school districts and, and school board members across the state are hearing the same story and making it very difficult. So that's going to be tricky. Here's some pros and cons for each of these tools. Special service districts and special service areas. You can isolate the revenue. You can get some off balance sheet financing, if you will, that's, that's isolated to the growth. It's hard sometimes to isolate the costs within those districts without creating a separate water system or a separate road system or public safety system because the city is already going to be providing services there so limiting the cost can be tricky whereas isolating the revenue not so much it's sort of easier you have separate government you have separate tax you might have a continued tax under assessment areas special assessment areas like this here on the, in the town center you can isolate revenue and you can isolate costs that are attributable to this area and it's a one-time cost as opposed to the assessment or the special service districts and special service areas where those costs might be ongoing because they're not limited to capital only. They do include operational costs. The special assessment areas limit costs to capital costs uh, with some, some rare exceptions. Cities in control of the assessment area and the process, you can evaluate the costs and the benefits and come up with a fair and equitable distribution of those costs and benefits. And you limit, or there is a limitation to the assessments that are made. So you decide how much and when and who gets what. The cons are you have to administer the assessment area. You do have if you do any financing, it's all going to be on balance sheet as well, meaning it's Harriman City's debt. Now, there are restrictions that limit that, so it, no one's going to say, well, if it doesn't get paid, 
then you've got to forfeit your sales tax or your property tax to repay the obligation. It does, it's not that way uh, because it is limited to the, the remedies and the, uh, the securities outlined in that financing if you do that. Tax increment financing, you can isolate revenue and costs. It's in the city's control. You have some cost flexibility. You can include a more diverse array of capital costs under tax increments, some more privately um, focused, if you will, costs. For instance, up in Clearfield, they've used these tools all over the place. They could move a, uh, a master muffler shop back, set it back off the corner a little bit, maybe put a new facade on the building and would still qualify for tax exemption, whereas under other financing tools that wouldn't be per permitted. It wouldn't be tax exempt. There could be parking garages, et cetera, financed in tag with tax increment financing that would be an eligible capital cost. So there's some, some flexibility there. Limitations on taxes and terms, you drive that. You negotiate that with other taxing entities. And if, if you want to be if you want to be extra special, and if you have a front runner station, a light rail station, or a bus rapid transit station, you can create now, based on the legislation that was recently approved, a, a housing and transportation reinvestment zone, which is tax increment financing, same concept, with extra rules tied to it, but it also has some extra advantages, one being you don't need to negotiate with any other taxing entity for the share of their future revenues. You slap it down, and if the Governor's Office of Economic Opportunity agrees with your plan, they'll slap it down with you and provide incremental revenues to you to help pay for improvements within that HTRZ. So it's different, and it's, but it's tax increment financing. Then lastly, we have the public infrastructure districts where you isolate revenue, you limit the costs to capital costs within that area or costs off-site that benefit that area. You have off-balance sheet financing and there is a limitation of the tax based on what you agree to in a governing document. You do create a separate government and there is a separate tax within your city boundaries. Those are the cons. So what are others doing to wrap up here? Then we can have some questions and answers. Forcing development to pay for itself seems to be the trend, still. However, that's changing a little bit. I'll, I'll say here, uh, developers funding with impact fee reimbursement. That's a, been a common tool for years, and I think most of the communities are still doing that. You build it, when they come and we get the impact fees, we'll give it back to you. Or if you upsize, we'll certainly give it back to you. There's uh, HOA-backed bonds. On occasion, the developers will say, we'll, we'll pledge our property, we'll impose a master HOA fee against all of the property before we subdivide it and sell it to everybody else. That ends up being security for development-funded projects. Special assessment areas, been around for decades. They still, uh, they're still working. They still do work, believe it or not. They've been here for a lot of years. PID since 2019, um, they're gaining momentum. You're going to talk more about them tonight. But a lot more communities are looking at these and saying, well, they work or they don't work. Here's why we don't like them, but here's why we do like them. And they weigh in the balance what, what's good and bad in these particular areas. Then tax increment areas still, still in use. They've been around for decades as well. The future, as I see it, as I read the tea leaves, PIDs and what we're calling limited use infrastructure districts and dedicated infrastructure districts, both of these were introduced this last session to the by the legislature. Limited use site uh, improvement or infrastructure districts are, in my mind, special assessment areas created by a separate entity with a little bit of extra latitude in the sense that um, I don't think they go 30 years but they've got to be paid off when a home is permitted okay the dedicated uh, infrastructure districts 
they came out right at the end of the session and basically said property owners who meet this condition you get your your district created you've got a, a mill levy of six mills it's automatically yours it allows for some o and m operations and maintenance of a system that could be taxed as well with a limit up to zero zero one uh, one mil for operation ex expenses that didn't go away i think the legislature's pushing hard these. They didn't approve them, and so I'm not sure if that means there just wasn't enough time, or if that means we don't really think they're necessary, or there's enough lobbying against these tools. But as I read the tea leaves, there's going to be uh, this topic brought up again, probably in the interim session, and what happens, who knows. I think that's it. Questions? So, John, how many entities are doing half bids? Several right now, right? From what I understand, we had understood once there was only one. These or two guys there's, probably know better, better than I do. 50, there's, 60, uh, there's fifty or sixty bids with probably fifteen or twenty entities that have created bids. Within those entities, there could be multiple. Right. Like Olympia Hills had approved seven. Is that right? Seven bids. How many issued at this point? 10 to 15, something like that, wouldn't you think? So it's gaining momentum. You know, and then and it seems like every day there's a phone call, there's an email, something about this. What about this? What about that? It's not what we specialize in. Brennan specializes in these types of financings, but we're getting phone calls all the time. For a lot of different purposes, I'll say too. There's commercial, like the auto mall. There's uh, there's residential <clears throat> down in Salem. They're getting ready to approve a 2,000 unit residential pit. They've already approved a 1,500 unit pit. You know, in their minds, they say, "This is great. We don't have to deal with uh, all of these costs. They're going to be put in as the development goes in, and the financing's taken care of by that." development not us and others say stay away don't even talk to me about these pits we're not interested we won't do it but they use other tools they use assessment areas see that's great or you want to use an HOA backed financing developer you go do that on your own we're not going to worry about it you just don't bug us about it so different tools and different different responses by everybody questions Jared's still with us Jared do you have any questions no questions you unmuted briefly and then now it's muted again oh, okay. he might have said something he probably said no definitely new concept I think that's I think that's what I said no I perfect Thanks, right, Jared. So no, I do not have any questions. Okay. And I, thanks for the presentation, especially the front end of like how it should work or potentially work and how it's not been working with impact fees. Yeah, so, that's the tricky part. If if there's a solution to it, I haven't seen it yet, but we'll see. Okay. It changed because I think we've all just impact fees are going to be operating for years. But, but I also think you see over the years that it's never, it can't, the way they're structured in the state of Utah, they'll never pay for the group. Well, I, I haven't seen a, an option yet that shows me anything pays for the group. There's the O&M covered in it. That's what impacts everybody else. Well, in theory, if there are new residents paying taxes, they're covering their O&M, right? If, if residents are covering their O&M. Which is true of even the existing residents. Exactly. Right? I'm just saying so. that no, none of the new the long term. If it's residential, it's impacted by everybody here. There's nothing that, that you can say, oh, this is going to cover all the new growth that's going to happen. It's simply Well, not. there's, I think there's two two parts to the cost, right? One is the uh, 
installation of it and one is the management of it, right? right? Impact fees don't cover the installation of it or the operation of it. Well, and that depends on your agreements also because you can have agreements, which we haven't done, that say we will reimburse you up to what we collect on impact fees. And then they do cover that cost. <clears throat> or whoever buys their house helps cover that cost. But that, that's simple. There is certainly a lot of different cities that do exactly that. They say, we will reimburse up to the amount that we collect on impact fees for the impact that you're creating in, in the community. And at that point, after that, you absorb the rest of the cost, Mr. Mr. Developer, Mrs. Developer, and, and then they build that cost into the cost of the home. I mean, that certainly that, that's ways that are done. There's, there's, this, this city hasn't done that. I think we've done a terrible job at, at doing that. I think we've said, yeah, let's just reimburse you for everything. But um, there's ways but to I, structure that. I think that. Um I think it's semantics if we say things like an impact fee is different than an assessment, is different than a bond, is different than a tax, is different than the price of a house. Okay. They're all just different ways of taking money out of residents' pockets yeah, to pay exactly. for infrastructure, right? Yeah. And so um, even with the, you know, the impact fees and developers advancing the upfront costs, they're getting reimbursed those costs either through impact fees or through the sale of the property or the house. I agree, agree right? hundred percent. That's why when we try to say, oh, we want growth to pay for growth, it's like, it's probably not even realistic that growth pays for growth. Everybody pays for growth. That new homeowners and the existing homeowners, because I guarantee you that the O&M is never going to be covered by residential houses. It's going to be absorbed by everybody. True. Okay. Well, we appreciate it, Jonathan. Thanks for your time. Thanks for waiting for us tonight. Yeah, certainly. You might have more questions down the road as we start dabbling in this a little bit. Yeah, that was a really thorough presentation. Yeah. Very beneficial. We could follow up at some point if you wanted. Our consulting group does a lot of analysis on types of development. And to your point about growth paying for itself, capital or even operational, it's interesting that they've done some analyses that have shown different types of development are are able to pay for themselves yeah. in terms of lower cost of service to that type of development and higher revenues to the city, so the offset is positive to the city. Residential actually is changing a little bit, where it's historically been really negative for a community. They're saying now with point of sale and online collection of sales tax yeah. that the cost of a residential development is almost break even or even slightly positive to the city because of online sales collections which hasn't historically been the case because we weren't tracking that but that's uh, yes. that you, might be in, of interest to you do you yeah. think franchise taxes have a little role in that too because I mean like 25 years ago, not everybody had their cell phone and, and gathering that franchise tax. So it seems like there's a lot of collection of different types of franchise taxes that are beneficial for residential kind of things. Also. Could be. The the phones of themselves, it's interesting. We look at energy sales tax collection trends for cities all across the state, and energy sales tax is going up. But telephones and cable, even worse, really? seem to be dropping year over year. Cable's falling off the face of the planet, basically, in terms of franchise tax collections. So, but, hey, electrical making up the difference. Yeah, it probably is. Do you think density plays a role in that as well? Because we're more dense as communities rather than these larger communities that are spread out? In, for point of sale or a capture of taxes? Oh, yeah. I think so. You get more people and they're buying more online, etc. Yeah. Is helping our distribution system here in the state with half from point of sale half from population seems to be working really well for cities like Harriman that are growing they're growing faster than others maybe because density is a little higher here than others there's been a lot more uh, 
over the last decade, I think I've seen that's come in and that increases population, it increases point of sale. And that, I mean, that's really antithetical to um, assumptions that, you know, were part of decision making three, four, five years ago was, you know, high density is bad. It, it's potentially the only development that's actually paying for itself. Beneficial. I mean, that's oof. But in the right place. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but right that would place, be good yeah. to know, you know, I, I definitely think those refreshers that, that follow the market every, you know, few years are really important for decision making and understanding how to make better developments. Yeah, planning in the right area for the right type of improvements, type of developments can be, I mean, obviously that's critical. That's why you have general plans, right, and yeah. zoning to try to strategically place that type of development, so... Okay, what for motion to adjourn? Make a motion to adjourn City Council work meeting. Go to the general. All in favor? Second. Aye. 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 Aye.